What comes to mind in the end gives a clearest sense of what is the substance of an individual's mind. And so I was doing research today, thinking about our first time together, how we would spend our time together, and I found an interesting post concerning uh, some famous last words. And so what I want to do this morning is just share a couple of favorite uh, last words that I found. Leonardo da Vinci, everyone knows who that guy is, right? Uh, painter of the Mona Lisa, one of the most significant inventors and artists of all time. Listen to what he said. He said this, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality that it should have. Famous last words. Also, consider, Lee, uh, consider Sir Isaac Newton. Remember this guy is the guy who said, what goes up must come down. During a pandemic, this guy uh, founded something called calculus. So, pretty significant guy, pretty intelligent guy. Listen to what Isaac Newton said. Isaac Newton said, I don't know what I may seem to the world, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then in finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than the ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me." But perhaps one of my favorites came from Prince Albert, and I don't know if this is the one in a can or not. Anyway, it's some Prince Albert, but he said this, I have had wealth, rank, power, but if these were all I had, how wretched I should be. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee." And some of you might say, well, why on earth are you taking us through last words? This is your first words to us as pastor, and here you are focusing on final words. And let me just say how grateful Katie and I are that the Lord has provided this opportunity for us to come together at this juncture in life so that we can grow together, so that we can know Him more, so that we can come together and make Him known. We are so grateful and blessed beyond words to be able to call myself the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Starkville, Mississippi. And I've been told that I'm saying that right. Starkville, is that right? It's not Starkville, right? It's Starkville. Okay, all right. I may change, but you'll just have to bear with. And it's not, oh, I know it's not Starksville, right? That's a no-no. It's not Starksville. There was no Revolutionary War guy named Starks. I got it. All right, I got it. All right. So we're glad that we're here, but at the… So some of you may be wondering, why are we focusing then? You're taking us through final words. These are your first words to us. Why? I want you to know that even from the beginning, I have the end in mind. And it's one thing to start strong. It's quite another thing to finish strong. Ask the tortoise and the hare, right? It's one thing to start strong. It's important to start strong. But what matters in the end is not so much how you start, but praise God, how you finish. And so, at our time together, what I want to do is I want to set a trajectory that even from the beginning has the end in mind. But it's not just any end that I want to put forth before you. It's not just simply any end that I have in mind. It's, it's an end that has eternity in mind, that sets its hope in what really matters. And you say, what really matters? What really matters is glorifying God. So, do you have your Bible here today? I hope that you do. Uh, I knew where we were going this morning, so I already opened mine with a little ribbon, but I'll give you some time to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And of course, that's the end of the book of Ephesians. And at the end of Ephesians, you can read about Paul's uh, affinity with the Ephesian church. He loved the elders in Ephesus. When he left Ephesus for the last time, he knew that he would never be back. 
The elders begged him not to go, but he felt compelled to go. He left the Ephesus church with the Ephesus church crying on the seashore. They had this wonderful moment where Paul knew that he was never going to see them again. And of course, he wrote correspondence to them. And Ephesians 6 is the end of Ephesians, and Paul leaves his last recorded words to this church that he loves. And he has a word of encouragement for them, and that word of encouragement is to stand strong in the Lord. So hopefully you've had time to find it. Would you join me in reading the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 18, 18. Now, excuse me, verse, yes, 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray together. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this first sermon as pastor of the First Baptist Church of Starkville, Mississippi. Father, I pray that in your word that is spirit-inspired, that we would see the Son and give glory to the Father. In your name, amen. So this last section of the letter, if we were to get into it, and we can't do the context because of time, but I encourage you to read the context. Perhaps many of you are familiar with Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 is that passage that talks about uh, infamously the, the putting on the whole armor of God. Most of us are familiar with it, and if you're not familiar with it this morning, maybe you are not used to the Bible or don't know your way around it. Ephesians chapter 6 is one of those passages that Christians look to as we think about living this Christian life that God has called us to, and it calls us to stand strong. And the way that we stand strong is to remember who we're fighting against. It's not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And then to fight those, that battle, we're encouraged to put on this spiritual armor to engage in that spiritual warfare. But this last section of the letter tells the story of what concerns Paul. And what concerns Paul is proclamation proclamation. And you say, well, what on earth is Christian proclamation? Let me tell you. Christian proclamation is the moment when the man of God tells the people of God about the plan of God to sum all things up in Christ. Christian proclamation seeks to comfort the sinner, uh, com- excuse me, confront the sinner, comfort the afflicted, and charge people everywhere to give glory to God. Christian proclamation occurs when the Son of God is faithfully lifted up, when He is proclaimed. And we know what Jesus said. Jesus says, when I am proclaimed, when I am lifted up, what will He do? He will draw all men to Himself. I'm so grateful that we had the moment in December. I received a text from one of my friends in Tennessee, and he told me, he said, uh, when you preach before the people, let the lion of the Word of God out of its cage. Martin Luther, when he led the Reformation, people came up to Luther and said, how did you do such a work? He said, I simply preached, and the Word of God did all the rest. And so, when the Son of God is lifted up, what's He say? When He is lifted up, then He will draw all men to Himself. When He is proclaimed, when He is lifted up, the Spirit draws people to the Son, all to the glory of the Father. And so, Christian proclamation, what concerns Paul at the very end? Christian proclamation, it reveals the wisdom of God through using weak instruments like someone standing in a, on a stage like this, proclaiming the mystery of God, weak instruments of jars of clay to reveal the matchless glory of God. And so, Paul's concern is this Christian proclamation. But let me say this to you, Christian proclamation is resisted, and it's rare. 
It's both resisted and it's rare. And it's resisted for the same reason that it's rare. Because Christian proclamation, if it's true, genuine, faithful Christian proclamation, then what it does is it rests on the power of God to change hearts. It declares that unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. It declares that in a moment like this, unless the Spirit of God comes down, we might as well go play in the pasture next door. No point in even being here unless the Lord comes. Because we realize that only the power of God can change hearts, and it's for that reason the temptation of the preacher is to rely on other things. And he's tempted by individuals in the congregation to say, oh, you know, you weren't funny enough that week, or you should have told a different joke that week, or, you know, you, you didn't dress the way that you should have dressed, or some of those kind of things, instead of encouraging the man of God to bring the Word of God to the people of God to effect real change. And it's resisted, as well as it's rare. And so what I want to do as we start our time together as your pastor is to show you in the beginning where my heart is, to show you in the beginning where my focused rest. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about Christian proclamation. And I've titled this sermon, The Weight of Proclamation. Hopefully you're taking notes today. The Weight of Proclamation. And uh, from Ephesians 6, what I want to do is I want to give you six points. And I really want to give you six points. But listen, I was looking over this and making my final edits, and I'm like, there is no way that I can give these people six points. So I can give you three points and then three really fast points, all right? So anyway, it's going to be six points, but it's going to be three really detailed points. And don't get frustrated. There's going to be six up there, but we're just really going to get uh, to look at three together. So uh, three truths, or excuse me, six truths concerning the ministry of the Word. So I want us to learn together six truths about this moment of proclamation, this ministry that God has given the church, this ministry of the Word. And the first thing for you to write down, the first thing for us to know is that the ministry of the Word, <clears throat> excuse me, the ministry of the Word, number one, is warfare. Number one, the ministry, and it's perfect that my voice cracks right as I start talking about warfare. Because this is what this is. We're here today. All the powers of hell are trying their best to distract you from listening. They're trying to prevent me from proclaiming, to get me off track, to talk about something other than what really matters. Christian proclamation is warfare. And Paul's time as a Christian ministry, if we were to go back and do a historical study on Paul, then we would see that Paul's time as a missionary has meant that he has been engaged in many challenging battles, and he's endured hardship. But the reason for his endurance is all for the sake of the gospel. In another letter, he would lay out all of the hardships that he had. He'd lay out his resume that being the Lord's ambassador brought him. And don't forget this, that he's in chains even as he's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. But in another place, he would say that his, he, his labor, he labored, he was imprisoned with countless beatings, often near death. Five times, he tells us, he received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times he was shipwrecked, a night and day adrift at sea. He was on frequent journeys in danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold exposure. And then to add to the list, Paul says, and apart from all of these things, there is the daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all the churches. And after all of that, you say, well, Paul, pack it up, buddy. But Paul says, no, no, I can't wait to do it all again. I remember I resisted becoming a preacher. I honestly thought in the very early stage when I, when I really felt the Lord calling me that 
it was taking the easy way out. Becoming a Christian minister was taking the easy way out. And quite honestly, if I'm fully transparent with you this morning, I really preferred the sound of Brigadier General Andy Brown. That sounded a lot better than Pastor Brown. And I've never liked the title Reverend, but anyway, I guess that's why I got my doctorate to finally get, a, get away from Reverend. But anyway, it just sounded Pastor Brown I just pre, or Preacher Brown. That just didn't sound as good to my young ears as Brigadier General. Brigadier General just has a pomp and circumstance kind of sound. But my expectations of ministry were flawed. And you're going to hear me talk a lot about Charles Stanley because it's just who I am and his influence on me is just undeniable. And uh, I remember at my ordination to hear Dr. Stanley, I was so encouraged at my ordination to hear this man who was 50 plus years in ministry at that point and him telling me that people have so many varying ideas of what it means to be a preacher. And he told me a story, I remember this, he said that someone thought that all he did was ride around in a car all day, every day. That's what it meant to be a preacher. You just ride around and go here and go there and whatever you want to do. And he was relating to me what I already knew, a wrong perception about ministry. Now, here's, here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to suggest because anytime, you know, you start preaching a sermon like this and it sounds like, oh, poor me, oh, we've got we to gotta take care of the preacher. And I'm not talking about, I'm not suggesting that ministry is harder than what you do. Please understand that because I know that if, if I raise a crutch, then your crutch is bigger than mine. I know, I've played those games before. I'm not suggesting that ministry is harder than what you do. What I'm just simply trying to portray to you that ministry is warfare. Ministry is warfare. And if you expect anything else, then come and walk a mile in the shoes of a minister. Come try to live uh, uh, faithful as a Christian, as a doctor these days. Come try to live faithful as a lawyer, faithful as one who puts in telephone lines. I understand the challenge that all of us have, but think about a minister just for a moment. How many statistics do we hear of ministers that leave the ministry? Most who start out don't finish. So many of my contemporaries, I remember my ministry friends, the list is long, but these days it grows shorter and shorter and shorter. There's so many dangers, there's so many tolls, there's so many snares that have to be overcome, and those who don't finish, they might not finish well. And the only reason that I can think to equate for those statistics is ministry is warfare. There's pressure from every direction, and if you are a Christian here this morning, then you know the pressure. I'm not convincing you, if you're faithfully living out as a Christian, then I'm not convincing you of any other pressure. You know the pressure. But if you're a Christian minister, you don't just know the pressure. You live in the pressure. I keep a quote attributed to Luther close to me when I consider my calling. Luther said, I was born to fight devils and factions. It is my business to remove obstacles to cut down thorns, to fill up quagmires, and to open and make straight paths. If I must have some failing, let me rather speak the truth with too great sincerity than once to act the hypocrite and conceal the truth. And this leads perfectly into our next point for considering the ministry of the Word. See, I told you we can't have six. Uh, this leads great into our next point of considering the ministry of the Word. Number two, the ministry of the Word is grounded in prayer. Look at the text. Notice the emphasis that begins our section, and I'm looking specifically at verse 18. What does it begin with? In my English Standard Version, the first word in verse 18, seven, or 17 and 18 is broken up by a word, and that single word there is pray or praying. But count the alls in the section that I brought before you, verse 18 through 20. All, praying all times in the Spirit 
with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. For alls in that passage, for alls, all to emphasize this important ministry that God has given to His people. So many of you have come up to me this morning. I've received so many texts this morning from individuals telling me the same thing. I'm praying for you. To which I simply plead with you as your pastor this morning, please never stop. Please don't ever stop. You see, a ministry of prayer, God's given us this ministry of prayer. You know what that does? That reveals the source of our strength. When we pray, we're declaring that our strength comes from above, not from within. Above, not from within. And so quickly notice the emphasis. We're to pray at all times. How? In the Spirit or without ceasing. Some of you say, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? I like Billy Graham's answer. He was asked that question one time. He said, well, the whole time I've been preaching, I've been praying. Anyway, pray without ceasing. In the Spirit, that is, what are you doing? You're seeking the will of God in every situation. And so the substance of our praying is supplication. You say, what is supplication? Supplication is asking God to provide everything that we need. And if we do that, everything that we need In some cases, COVID has taught us the value of a breath. We need every breath, every breath that comes from God. And so praying takes perseverance. And you remember the story of the disciples. Those disciples, they were at Jesus' hour of testing. They were the closest to Him. They couldn't even bear with Him just for a little while in prayer. But remember this. Here's my challenge to, to you this morning. A church will never never rise above the prayers of its people. First Baptist start, but we will never rise higher than our prayers. I have a little thing that I keep close to me. I should never take on more than I can pray about. And I'm not going to take on more at this church than we can pray about together. Now, I don't know about you, but I can pray about a whole lot. Amen? But that's how we move forward. We move forward on our knees. We advance on our knees or we don't advance at all. When folks would come and tour the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, Spurgeon sometimes would give tours. He would come out and give tours. And he would walk by the pulpit and, yeah, there's the pulpit. And he wouldn't point to the pulpit and say, there's the powerhouse of the church. No, he would go down into the basement. He would go down into the boiler room where he would have people on their knees, especially during the service, praying. And then Spurgeon would look at those folks on their knees, interceding in prayer, and he would point to them, to those walking by the church, and he said, right there is the powerhouse of the church. Do we value prayer? Does First Baptist, and I don't know, I'm asking, does First Baptist Starkville value prayer. Speaking of the power of prayer, it was another great preacher, John Chrysostom. Listen to what he said about prayer. He said, the potency of prayer, the power of prayer, hath subdued the strength of fire. It has bridled the rage of lions, hushed anarchy to rest, extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burst the chains of death, expanded the gates of heaven, assuaged diseases, repelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course, and arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. Oh, church, pray without ceasing in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. And then what does Paul say? And while you're at it, pray specifically for me. What's he want him to pray for him? Look at the text. Pray for the very words the preacher preaches, that he would have boldness 
to proclaim the words the Spirit gives. In other words, Paul's concern is he wants to get it right. In another place, Paul says the same thing to his readers. At the end of the book of Colossians, he says this, at the same time, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And then he says this, that I may make it clear, clear, which is how I ought to speak. And if you were to come to me today and you were to say, Pastor, how can I pray for you? And I would say, Ephesians chapter 6 and Colossians 4. How can I pray for you today? Ephesians chapter 6 and Colossians 4. Matter of factly, in my study, and I've had it for a while now, I have that prayer written out. I have that prayer that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, that I might speak it boldly, that I may speak it clearly, that I might know Him and make Him known, and in my making Him known, let it be bold, let it be clear. Which takes us to our third point this morning. The ministry of the Word, number three, takes courage. Remember, Paul's in prison, and the reason he's in prison is because of proclamation. His prayer is not to be, don't miss this, his prayer is not to be released from a difficult situation. It's not, hey guys, pray that the prison doors will open like they did in Philippi. He says, pray that I may be found faithful right where I am. Pray that while I'm in prison, words may be given to me. You say, Paul, who's your audience? It didn't matter. Whoever God brought to him, that was his audience. I learned a long time ago, don't worry about who's in the room, who's not in the room. God will bring who needs to be there right there. And in our current age where the devil is raging fierce, on issues such as sexuality, marriage, and even what it means to be human. Preachers and churches need courage to be faithful in the way that we proclaim the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because only it has the power to save. Only it has the power to change a heart. And I appreciate Hugh Martin, the Scottish preacher from the past, said concerning the need for courage from the preacher. Listen to what he said. This is a lengthy quote, but it's good. Listen to what he said back in the 1800s. Alas, that so many who ought to be teachers deal as false and irreverently with the oracles of God as a cat playing with her kittens or a kitten playing with a cork. I am sorely afraid that there is to be a great decline in our church a great lack of holy courage and contenting for the infallible truth of the entire Scriptures and truly men that can tolerate the substitution of the natural for the supernatural or human reasoning for divine revelation. They are no longer worthy of their sustenation, and they are no longer worthy of their salt. And then he has this to say, May God raise up men taught from above, and valiant from every jot and tittle of divine truth, for it shall stand, should heaven and earth pass away. And if you meet any, Martin continues, after I'm gone, who go courageously, stand for all revealed truth, then give them my compliments. And tell them to be strong and of good courage for now. Even at this present time, their heads shall be lifted up above their foes. Let them yield not to the current sentimental Christianity that would convert men's faith in a living, glorious, inexhaustible, infallible word into empty-headed, empty-hearted speculations no better than Chinese puzzles or acted charades, and then he says God will avenge such trifling. The Scriptures cannot be broken. It is the testimony of Him who is Himself the eternal Word. Hugh Martin died in 1855, 1885, 
But his quote, I believe, is a representative of a, not so much of a preacher from the past, but that quote seems right in line with what Paul's desire is, and that is to be found faithful. And listen, Starkville, at the beginning, I have the end in mind. And my desire with our time together is that I will be found faithful. You see, James 3, 1 says, many of you ought not to become teachers, knowing that in church we shall incur a stricter judgment. Here's what's the challenging part about being a minister. You're not responsible for my soul. I'm responsible for yours. And I'll give an account, not so much of how you responded to how I led you, that's between you and the Lord, but I'll give an account to how faithfully I led you. Did Andy Brown lift the sun? Did Andy Brown preach the Word? And at this junction, it's not just did he, but it's will he. And the only way that I can make it there is if you pray for me. Faithful proclamation is a ministry of the Word, as the text tells us, and this is those other three points that we just can't develop. It requires knowledge of the Savior. It comes from above, and it's compelling. It requires knowledge of the Savior. It comes from above, and it's compelling. And as I think about these things, I just ask myself one question, who on earth can accomplish these things? Who on earth is competent for things like this? And the answer to that, listen, this is the freeing part. None of us. None of us. We're going to grow weary. We're going to have to be reminded to keep alert with all perseverance and prayer. Who can do these things? None of us. And that's why Paul pleads for prayer. So in this first message, as we lay the foundation of our time together, I want to get it straight. Prayer, dependence upon God, is our primary priority. It's our, it's our, it's our first priority. And I remember going into Dr. Stanley's office for the first time. Here is a man that I've, I've loved all my life, watched on television all my life. We had Dr. Stanley for breakfast before we had anything else for breakfast. And so I remember this man that I just uh, loved from a distance. And then finally, I get the chance to go into his office and meet him. And I noticed something on his desk, right on his desk. It wasn't this placard that says, Charles Frazier Stanley, THD, blah, 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 blah. It didn't have any of that. All it had on a small name, whatever that thing is that you lay on your desk, that little name thing, what do you call it? Yeah, you don't know either. Great. I don't either. <laughs> but that thing that you lay on your desk, it said, it said a simple quote from Hudson Taylor. And that quote spoke louder to me on that man's desk than many of the other lessons that I learned there. Bear not a single care thyself. One is too much for thee. The work is mine and mine alone, and thy work to rest in me. Bear not a single care thyself. One is too much for thee. The work is mine and mine alone. Thy work to rest in me. And let me say this as we bring this message to a close. Depending on God is what it's all about. The ministry that we have together at First Baptist Startful, it'll go as far as God wants it to. You say, how can you be so sure? Because you got a praying pastor, and I got a church that's going to be praying. And it'll go as far as God wants it to go. You say, how far is that? I don't know. But that's the beauty of it all, is we get to remind people everywhere 
of this king who came, this king who lived, this king who died, this king who rose again, and this king who promised he's coming again. And all of those who by faith call upon him, all of him, he will forgive, he will cleanse, and he will make new. But you have to trust in him. You know why we can depend upon God? Because we first learned to depend upon him for salvation. I'm trusting in Jesus for my salvation, my eternal security. I rest on him. I can trust, I can trust him for anything else. And if you're here this morning and you've never taken that first step of obedience, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me say this. Depending on God begins first by trusting him for your salvation. Won't you do that today? Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we're thankful for this time, this time that you've given us together to know Jesus and to make him known. It's my prayer for everyone within the sound of my voice that if they don't know you, today they would hear your voice calling them by name, telling them to lay it down and simply trust in God. In Jesus' name, amen.